Okay, you're starving, right? And your bums are sore. So I wanted to ask you this question anyway, but now I'm going to let you move a little bit. So um, instead of putting your hand up, stand up. I need to know who are the marketers here. But then stand up and sit down. Your own's already stood up. <laughs> marketers. Okay, just wiggle while you're up, because I know your bums are sore. Okay, good, sit. Who are the agencies? Don't be afraid. Okay, wiggle. Make the most of it. Okay, and who are the solution providers? Okay, really, you must not be afraid. Good job. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. It's lovely to be here. It feels like yesterday and a million years ago that we were together. Um, it was a million years ago. It's been a great morning. I missed the very, very beginning of it, but, um, but I heard it was marvelous, all about purpose. You've heard a ton about technology. Um, you will see from the slide, I'm going, hello, low tech. Uh, last night, Bayers asked me, um, now that I've left Hollard, um, what Lux TI am I using on my slides? <laughs> that is my CI on my slides. Um, I want to just change up things a little bit, and when um, Sarah asked if I would speak, um, she gave me a topic that was too high a grade, and I said no. Um, and then when, when um, the, the identity was being un unfilled for the conference, and it said, relearn, rewind, rebuild, I was like, ooh, relationships. Um, and the reason I, I wanted to talk about it was, partly because of the amount of reflection, oh, and I didn't do that on purpose, reflection that I've done on leaving um, the company that I adored for 10 years. And some of the things that I was um, just thinking about when I made my farewell speech the other day. Um, but I also thought I'd um, share some of the things that I shared last time from this book of mine that you will all be able to read in about 40 years when I eventually release it. <laughs> It actually does exist, and it's here, handwritten by me. This is worth a lot of money. It's the only one that there is. But um, I, I want to just share some things that were reflections um, in my farewell speech and that are, I've been noting in this book since. Shall I tell you when I've been writing this book since? Would you like to know? The 2nd of December, you want to guess? 2012. Okay. It's been going a long time. Okay, so, so this is about you. This is not about technology. This is not about anything external. It's only about you. And I hope I leave you with a gift. Okay, so the first thing, um, and for those of you that have heard me speak before, you know that I tell you that we have to acknowledge that we all sell the same shit as each other. Whatever your cool product, your cool tech, your cool anything is, it's only cool until the next guy says, oh, that's cool. And they're going to copy you. And unless you can be humble and realize that, um, you're really going to get lost behind. When you realize that you're after the same customers as the next guy, you're all hunting for the same thing, um, you're really going to get stuck. And the humility that comes from realizing that we're all selling the same stuff, that we're all going to be copied, that any advantage that we have um, is only for a short period, is really an important humility to have because it lets us do um, something really special. It lets us realize that we have to go back to some basics. There's two things that I want to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what to do about them. And the one is, the most important thing to bring to anything is this notion of grace. What is grace and graciousness? Grace from the definition, from definitions online, is this, a polite and thoughtful way of behaving, a smooth and pleasing way of, behave, of, of moving, courteous goodwill. The, love, the loveliest one, I think, is this one. It says, bringing honor or credit to something by your attendance or participation. What do I love about being gracious and the idea of grace? I'll tell you what it is. Let's just stop here for a minute. 
Grace and graciousness is that thing that happens when everybody's playing their part and something magnificent, magnificent is created. Marketers, and I know you're the majority in here, if you've been on a film set when you're creating a TV ad, and there's this chaos of 946 million people, and you're wondering, what the hell are they all gonna do here? But somehow, they move fluidly, doing their thing. Everybody knows their part. You yourself know that even though you're on set, you're, you don't go talk directly to the director. You go via the via the via the via. Everyone plays their part, even if it's just the guy who at one moment has to sprinkle water or whatever. He knows his part and she knows her part and everybody brings their grace to it. They bring honor or credit to your ad by the way they behave and the way they show up. Grace is about, if you've been on a, on a game drive, you know that when somebody spots the, the, the sighting, um, they let everybody in the area know. Why? Because everybody deserves to see that. There is a way that they share the sighting with each other. Not, they don't know, well, you're the, you're the boss because you're the, your game um, lodge is more expensive than mine and yours and yours and yours. Something happens where everybody gets a chance to see it. Actually, it was on a game drive where I watched that happening where I was thinking, there's such grace in this. They want to make the experience beautiful for everybody, that everybody gets a chance to see. Um, you may or may not know that I have a degree in nursing. I'm now a medical legal hazard because that was a long time ago. But when you're in an operating theater, the grace, the way that people move and they know their roles. You've seen it in, if you've seen um, kitchens, we see kitchens um, on MasterChef or whatever. Nobody walks behind anybody else without saying, I'm behind you. There is something beautiful about film sets, operating rooms, game drives, kitchens, everything that is about grace and about considering your role and what you're doing. And it's super duper important for this other reason. And the other reason is, that underneath it all, people do business with people, not companies. A guy called Mark Drizzen told me that. People do business with people, not companies. You know why? Because we all sell the same shit as each other. Okay. But it's the people, it's the connection you make, it's the grace that somebody brings that makes you want to do business with them. So what does that mean? And what does that, how do we do what do we do with all of this stuff? And I luckily walked in just in time this morning to hear Kath say, Heidi always says that it takes a village to raise a brand, and it really does. I had to change this picture because it had a little purple person with an H on it. Uh, so now it's, um, it's any brand. But it really does take a village to raise a brand in a business and that everybody participates in their way in making sure that they are in service of that brand and that business objective and that organization. So what do we have to do in order to be able to do that? I need 11 hands. Okay, we have to start with this. We have to start, oh God, aren't they gorgeous, my illustrations? <laughs> I did them myself with a pen, a real pen. And I scanned them myself because I don't have a PA anymore. Mm. Anyway, so we have to start with a very simple thing and that's strategy. Strategy is really, um, sounds so complicated, but it's really, why is there a ship there? Because strategy is about knowing where you're going, where your ship is sailing. Are you going against, uh, are you going against great seas to Rio? Do you need a gigantic ship with a, a crew of 912 with food for six years? Or are you going against, um, uh, are you going across Benoni Lake where you only need a, rowing boat with one person and an energy aid. That's what strategy really is, is knowing where you're going, what you need to get there. But the key thing is knowing that, making sure that everybody knows where you're going, that everybody understands that strategy. We seem to have complexified strategy that only the strategists know what the strategy is. And God help them if they forget the slides, right? Because <laughs> then there's no strategy, then we're screwed. We have to demystify it and we have to make sure that it's everybody's. Because if you know where you're going and you're all going in the same direction, you'll be able to adjust, adapt and get there on your way. In fact, it's so easy that kids say it. Kids even whine. That's about strategy. You know when your kids say, mommy, mommy, did it on purpose. On purpose, being on purpose. 
is what we all have to do every day. Being on purpose is being directed, um, intentional, deliberate, having focus, clarity, doing things be by design, being able to articulate it, and everybody being able to articulate it. When everyone can do that, then we're all going in the same direction and we can get to the place that we're going. The other bit of magic that I think is essential to understand, that's a bowl. Can you see that it's a bowl? Okay, good. Are you sure? It's got shading. That's how you can tell that it's a bowl. It's got dimension. We don't exist in a vacuum and nothing exists without context. And we, you know, so many people this morning have talked about silos. Even talking about silos, siloing. Nothing exists in a vacuum. We have to remember that content exists in context and that we have to um, always be aware of everything that's going on around us. You can get so blinkered that you forget that your content exists in a context. So your sexy technology or your, your marketing plan or your whatever it is exists in a bigger thing. Um, and you need to make sure that you have in mind whatever else is going on in the bigger picture so that you can make sure that you can adjust and adapt to whatever else is going on. And there's one more thing to think and then I'll think about it and then I'll tell you what I think we should do about it. The other thing that I think that happens is, and to be honest, I didn't hear a lot about it this morning, is that the objectives, the digital technology, marketing, communication objectives are in service of one thing only. They're in service of the business objectives. Those are first and foremost what we have to understand and be clear on. That's really how you know where to take the ship, right? So go back to the office, chat to the people who work on the client service team for your clients, chat to your own team, and find out if they know what the business objectives are. Some of my teammates will know that we asked once in a, in a little internal creative review, we asked what the turnover was of one of the business units. They were all in the room. Did anybody get it right? Nobody got it right. How, how can you be in service of a business if you have no idea what the business strategy is? So, I mean, this very simplified sort of Harvard-style diagram, we want to laugh at it, but so many people don't have any idea where the ship is sailing. They're so deep in the detail that we get lost. Okay, so, and I'll tell you something. Smarties, if people started putting their entries together, Put the business objectives in, for goodness sake. Not 14 million impressions and, and compressions and depressions and whatever. We don't know why you're doing it. So start there. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we start off by doing this amazing thing, um, pressing the right button, and putting on your hat as a leader. And everybody deserves to wear a leader hat. I learned about a leader hat from my um, CEO at Mark in 1912, <laughs> who, when he made me the manager of the healthcare research division, said, you're very good at doing costings, you know how to write a report and a proposal, now you need to be a leader. And he said, imagine, Jonah's trying not to puke because she's heard this story 5,000 times. Imagine outside, it was when we still had offices, remember those days when there were offices and you went to a place? He said, imagine before you walk out the, de out the door of your office that you've got a, a hat stand, put your leader hat on and think of how you'll behave now. And it was the most remarkable thing, because I did. I stood differently, I walked differently, I spoke to people differently, because my job wasn't just about getting the costing done or getting a proposal out. It was really about understanding the business of the business my business, my client's business, whoever's, and understanding the people who were gonna deliver that as a leader. And I think what we miss so much is the opportunity to let everybody wear a leader hat so that every, everybody can be bigger than the little piece of work that they're doing and that they feel that they may or may not be contributing on. Back to what Kate was talking about a little bit and um, what some of the panelists a little bit earlier alluded to, this really great word search, which I think you'll win in a second, um, is probably, for me, the most important thing 
um, in building relationships, building connections, and making sure you can hit your strategy. And that is WIGSOP, which if you can see, I don't know if you can see behind the chairs, stands for, I love me an acronym, I never ever mean anything though, stands for the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. You have to bear in mind that whatever you're doing is part of a greater whole. And in fact, when I, when I um, joined Highlight, we used to have a weekly WIGSOP meeting. Isn't that the most ridiculous name of a meeting you've ever been to? But it was quick, it was a quick hour meeting and there were, I don't know, 15 people in it. Everybody had a chance to tell their part so that everybody knew what everybody else was doing. So that we didn't go back into our silos and just go, no, it's okay, I'm gonna deliver that in, on time and the next oak didn't know what he was doing or she was doing or the next person. You have to integrate everything and everybody. Not only everything, but everybody. And I think that we need to be um, more generous more generous, that's a word. And grace and generous go together. More generous with considering um, how to integrate, how to consider people in um, coming together to deliver whatever the business objective are. It feels like such a, a simple, a silly little thing is letting people know um, what everybody is on about in their day. Is that my time up or is somebody's phone ringing? Okay. How, but how can you do that? Well, you can do it by referencing this brilliant work that I learned in first year varsity, which was also in about 19. <laughs> 42, no it wasn't, okay. This is a model called transactional analysis. Transactional analysis. I had gin for breakfast by a man called Eric Byrne, who wrote a book also called Games People Play. And last night we were talking about power plays at dinner. And too much of the time, people are playing games for the wrong reasons or, or doing what they're doing for the wrong reasons. Think about this, right, so what's PAC? Does anybody know? P stands for parent, Jo does, <laughs> she's, she's heard me. P stands for parent, A stands for adult, and C stands for child. Those are the e ego states that we have. And you can access a different ego state anytime. You just have to be conscious of it. Imagine that you talk to someone from your parent ego state. Okay, I'm now going down to you. How are you going to respond back to someone who's parenting you? From which ego state are you going to talk back? From your child. If you think about the typical relationship between a supplier, what an awful word, and a client, still a crap word also, client, client and supplier, what is that? It's a parent-child relationship, isn't it? It's awful. Who's the parent? <laughs> <laughs> but it typically is that. And, and relationships in um, departments as well, a boss and a subordinate, well, words are really terrible, is a parent and child relationship. I have learned that the best way to get the best out of your um, team members is to go into an adult, adult transactional state. It is the only way to go. No matter whether you're the junior, no matter whether you're the least experienced, no matter whether you're the supplier or the incumbent, decumbent, subcumbent, it doesn't matter. Being in an adult ego state always is the only way to be and the gifts that come out of that are remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. How do you do that? Well, you do that by starting. You can't wait for somebody to go adult on you and you stay in child. You have to just begin. And it, we are all adults, right? I think there's a lovely book um, called Maverick, it's not old, but a guy called Ricardo Semler wrote it. And he, he said it, it, it overwhelmed him when he realized that the lady that cleaned the factory room floor, for the factory floor in a big like airplane parts manufacturing company was also on her church's board or her school's PTA or whatever, but just because she was the cleaner, he spoke down to her without remembering that she's a whole adult human being. We have to do that more. 
I'll tell you the other magic thing. Do you know that this ratio is? I actually was going to say that I wasn't going to put one number in this presentation, but here's one. This is a ratio that's magic. It's the ratio of appreciation to criticism that people need. Guess which one is appreciation? Say it loud, or I know you won't have heard it. Five. People need five times more appreciation appreciation to criticism. So what happens when things are going pair and you call in your supplier and you parent them? You tell them all the shitty things that are going on without ever saying one nice thing. That is not how relationships work. Relationships work like a dream when you can find some cool things to say about how well things are going. Then you shit on them. That sounds terrible. People receive, people receive criticism so well if you come from an adult ego state and you really, really work hard to put the criticism into appreciation and gratitude. And that's not only in your relationships um, in business. Go and try it with your kids and go and try it with your partners. It makes the world of a difference. It's a positivity ratio. And I cannot miss the opportunity to say this, if you have in mind that we need to be in an adult, adult ego state, and you have in mind that people need five to one appreciation to criticism, I cannot stress more that the whole idea of pitches in relationship, in relation to um, marketing and suppliers suck. Full stop, that's a full stop, a period. Anybody think that I'm wrong? Who likes pitches? God, no, so quiet. They suck. Because you know what happens in a pitch, in a pitch situation? The client is the parent. The prospective supplier is the child. Usually the CMO or whoever the boss is sits at the head of the table. Speaks really quietly so that everybody has to lean in closer to hear. <laughs> and then if they're really good CMO, then they let their juniors talk first. Because that's patronizing as hell. Pitches are terrible. Because people do business with people, not companies. Remember that. So first you have to find out if this agency or supplier or product provider can do the work. Check that they're not competing with you. I have to smile, Lindy Lou. We have to. Um, and then invite them for a coffee and have a chemistry date. See if you vibe with them, if you like them, if you can connect with them. Because the world of creativity and the world of marketing is fraught, very hard to, to, um, to make progress in when, you're, when your budgets are shrinking and the demands are increasing. So make sure that you connect with people. And procurement doesn't have that on the score sheet. They just don't like it. Try and connect with people. Try not to have pitches. Because remember, people do business with people, not companies. Can I tell you what I think the worst thing is for um, putting yourself in a child state? You know what? What do most people put at the end of a presentation? Two words. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'll just walk backwards out of the room now because you are more than me. We have to get more adults. Anyway, okay. The, the last few things I want to talk about is really how, what your role is and how you can play a role. So um, sometimes we forget, and it's back to the idea of grace, is knowing the role that you play um, and, and bringing it so beautifully so that you add, um, you make the thing that you're contributing to more beautiful and more um, um, unique and more special is to understand that sometimes you're a helicopter, sometimes you're a snorkeler, and sometimes you're a scuba diver. I'm sure without those words you couldn't have told that that was a snorkeler, right? <laughs> I will not be applying for a job in the creative department of any of your agencies. What does that mean? It means sometimes I, if I'm the CMO, am the, the helicopter. I have to know everything that's going on in the organization, business objectives, everything that's going on. So then I can go to my team, to the heads of the various departments who are snorkeling, because their job as a snorkeler is to be able to look at me and go, hi, hi, what's happening? Oh, good, oh, good. And then to go to their team who are scuba diving deep, deep, deep down, getting the work done, being able to communicate. Sometimes, though, 
I am not that. Sometimes I'm the snorkeler. Because when I'm working with my CEO, he or she is the helicopterer, making sure that they understand the total span of what's going on in the business. I have to say, yeah, I get it, I get it, I get it. OK, good, no problem, OK. And then I'm, we have different roles, and we have to understand them. And we have to stay there. Because if everybody was scuba diving, or if everybody was helicoptering, we'd be in really big trouble. And it's really cool when you know the part that you have to play, and you just go and do that. In that transaction, in that relationship, it really is a gift to everybody. Um, it's about grace. OK. So I think Bea said something about from the customer's point of view. That's my favorite acronym. Everyone gets stuck on the F, though. Um, but I decided I wasn't going to talk about, no, you can't imagine what the F is, hey? I'm not saying it. OK, so the, I believe that from the deepest fiber of my being, but that's not what I want to talk about now. I want to talk about the other thing that's really critically important when you're building relationships. And that is, now suddenly I was scared that it wasn't the right thing. You have to ask yourself this, 5 million and 78 times an hour, who needs to know? Who needs to know? Because you have a pile of information, and 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 you have a pile of information. You have to ask yourself all the time who needs to know. Because whether you like it or not, whether we think that we're not, we are so siloed still. And because we're working at home, we're not wandering past someone going, oh, I wanted to tell you, Sarah, this thing. We don't have that. So we have to be deliberate about thinking. I've just learned this piece of information. I wonder who knows that. And who needs to know is not permission to tell other people secrets to other people. It's about, it's about um, opening your mind and making sure that you are generating the opportunity for the whole to be greater than the sum of the parts. Because you may have a piece of information that somebody else doesn't. So always ask yourself, who needs to know? Another thing that I really have learned um, to be so valuable in building relationships so that you do great work in service of the brand and in service of the business objectives is the notion that you don't always know everything. There is his story, her story, their story, our story, the next person's story, and then there is the truth. Here's how I learned that. I learned that when I was working at Come Air, and somebody uh, on a British Airways flight wrote me an email complaining about a, a cabin attendant that she was rude to him. I was mortified, and I said, dear Mr. Whoever, I'm so sorry, and I will beat them up forthwith. I didn't say that, really. But I apologized, and I said, I'm so sorry. They were wrong, and you were right. And I went back to the, the chief cabin attendant um, person, and I said, oh, this is terrible. How could this happen? She went to find out, she came back to me, and she said, you know that this customer was drunk and was being gropey and inappropriate with the crew member. And what did I learn from that? There are two sides to a story. I never, ever, ever again just believed anything that anybody came to me. I learned to say, thank you for letting me know. Let me find out a little bit more, and then I'll come back to you. And why is this relevant? It's relevant because as uh, marketers, we think that our team and um, our marketers are the shiz. And if there's poop going down, it's the agency's fault. And the agencies blame the client. So we have bloody client and bloody agency. Bloody client, bloody supplier. I'm not leaving you guys out. Solution provider. There is, there is never, it is never as clean as that. And we have to, if we're going to build relationships, come from adult to adult, take the time and go and ask the question, say, thank you, I hear you, cool, I'll be back. And go and find out the other side of the story, because I promise you there always is. Always, always is. Okay. The other thing that I have learned over time is back to, and what Kate was saying in her talk a little bit earlier. Meetings, 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 agendas, agendas, agendas. We didn't finish, let's have another one. Does anybody ever have agendaless meetings? Just called catch-ups. Oh my God, they're a gift. 
You get more out of an agendaless meeting, aka a catch-up, than anything you will ever spend your time with. And the more senior you get, the more important those are. Although you're sure that you don't have enough time for them. Just have them. Ask what's keeping a person up at night, not literally. Well, you can. Understand the business of people's business. Understand what's keeping them up at night. Because you have no idea the gems that you will gather and be able to take back into your um, team's world and be able to bring that um, um, into play to make uh, the business objectives be met much more easily. Have agendaless meetings. Just connect with someone. Have a coffee. If it's over in 20 minutes, it's over in 20 minutes. I tell you, in my time at Hollard, I met with every EXCO member every single month. Nobody ditched me, ever, because it was value for both of us. Have agendaless meetings. Okay. This is going to be a bit provocative, evocative, this slide. What are those people doing? Watching a building on fire. And I didn't draw it just because of the awful, awful thing that happened the other day. It's to demonstrate something else that we have to try and avoid. Um, we have to avoid a thing called, I read it in the book Humankind, I don't know if anybody read it, by Rutger Bregman. It's called the bystander effect. When there are a lot of people in meetings or working in teams and you make the assumption that someone else will say something or someone else will raise something or someone else will do something. And I'm reminded of um, Mzamo Masita who always says you have to be intentionally inclusive or you'll be unintentionally um, exclusive. You have to remember that it is so easy have you walked past sometimes or driven past or scrolled past, you see an ad and you go, oh my God, that is so bad. Did no one in the room say a thing? You are the one in the room who can say something or your house will burn down. We have got to speak up. We have got to speak up for the work, for the business objectives, for the voices that are not heard, for gender inclusion, for every kind of inclusion. Have to speak up. Please don't let the bystander effect make your business or your business objective suffer. Just speak up. Don't assume anyone will say anything. The bottom line is this. You have to be more inclusive if you want to not suffer from the fate of everybody sells the same shit as everybody else. You have to be more inclusive. You have to be more um, generous, more gracious, take more time, um, immerse people in the business of your business. Um, my favorite is this, repeat yourself, repeat, 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 uh, repeat, repeat, repeat. Say it again. When you're sick of it, repeat again. Tell people your business objectives. In meetings where you've gone down a rabbit hole and you write, 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 write down in the detail, just every now and then pull up. Repeat the business objectives. Remember why you're doing this. And then when you're sick of it, repeat it again. The other thing I always say is be consistent, insistent, persistent, and resistant, and relentless in making sure that everybody's on purpose, on strategy. It all ties together. And you can only do that if you take time and you build the relationships. And I'll tell you the joy that comes from that. I didn't draw this one, because the lines are definitely straighter. This comes from a book written by Wolfgang Grilke a long time ago. I've been using the slide since 1911. And really what he says in the, in the story, it's quite easy to interpret. He says that if everybody's doing their own thing, all those arrows going their own way, if everybody's doing their own thing, then the efforts of one and the efforts of another only equal one. They're not incremental. And you have turbulence. If you start getting alignment, then one plus one equals two. If you start to build that so that there's strength in what you're doing, you start to get one plus one is more than two. But if everybody, this is me now in like um, uh, editorializing on Wolfgang's slide, but if everybody knows where the ship is sailing to, if everybody's adult adulting, if everybody understands the business of the business, if everybody is treating everybody with care and dignity, if everybody is aligned, um, but strongly, you have a resonance. 
you have like a beehive buzzing. You have the efforts of one and the efforts of another combining to be infinite in what they can create. Infinite. And it is worth doing because I've seen the return on investment. At the end of the day, that little scribble at the bottom right of that billboard or whatever it is you're producing has your invisible signature on it. Has every member of the team's invisible signature on it. And whatever you produce, you should never be able to say, in a position to say, I didn't approve it, I didn't like it, I wasn't involved in it. As a member of a team serving a brand or serving a business, your invisible signature is on everything that you're in touch with. And it's a gift to be able to do that. The biggest gift, though, is this Barbie. No, she wasn't always that. She was always pink, I have to tell you. The biggest gift is bringing yourself. And why is there a picture of a lady in a pink dress? Because years and years ago, I went to speak at Gibbs, and I was wearing a pink dress. And a friend of mine in management consultancy came to me just before. She said, hey, oh my God, you're so brave. You're speaking to all these business people at a business school in a pink dress. I can't believe how brave you are. I didn't even realize that that was like a thing. Um, but I did, and I have ever since. I've promoted myself to black now because it's much more slimming. But the point is, I just went as myself. Being yourself and bringing yourself to everything that you do is the greatest gift you can bring your business and your brand and the people that you work with because people do business with people, not companies. And at the end of the day, when all else fails and life is tough and it's just all gone to shit, the other solution always is tequila. Can I have lunch? Thank you. Thank you.